welcome everybody this morning. Um, I'm starting with uh, my screen share, so you can't see me, but I'll be jumping on um, for the more hands-on portion of the class. But just to introduce myself, my name is Jim Halloran. I'm with um, the Office for Community Arts. Um, and this class is um, something that um, uh, we come up with, uh, with the Office for um, Senior Adults uh, virtual class, just to look uh, a little bit deeper into artists and some paintings. Um, so today, um, we are going to be looking at this artist, uh, Richard uh, Diebenkorn. We're not painting this. This is kind of a funny uh, painting to start with, but it's a self-portrait of this artist. Um, but the point of this class just beneath the surface is just to kind of understand um, the, the how part of, of why an artist um, makes art. So um, basically, we, we see paintings and we could read on the gallery walls. Um, sometimes the whys, but, but a lot of times the how is a mystery. And so for me as a painter, I really like to understand um, how something is made. So this class, I'll give you a little context about the artist, um, and then um, I'll move into uh, a demonstration um, so that we can understand um, how the art is made. So it should be exciting. So uh, Richard Diebenkorn, why is this guy uh, interesting? Well, he was uh, born in 1922 and um, he died in 1993. Um, but he's, he's known as an abstract um, painter. So I know abstract artists um, often, um, there's a lot of just questions around the, the why they make what they make. And we don't really even get to like the how because we're just like, I don't know what that is. Or, you know, oftentimes people say my, you know, my kid can draw that, right? So uh, we do have to understand a little bit about the why and then we'll get into the how. So uh, that's Richard uh, Diebenkorn here in front of his uh, large uh, abstract paintings. He, he served in World War II for a couple of years um, and went to art school on the GI Bill, like a lot of artists at the time. And he was known as an abstract expressionist. Um, so he was making uh, paintings just like alongside uh, other artists you might've heard of like Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock, um, but he's a little different. He's uh, actually an outlier. He's, he's actually very different from those artists. So um, let me show you this. This uh, most artists, um, they start off painting very realistic and then they become abstract. So what does that mean? Well, they start off, um, you know, trying to paint something to look as real as possible. So you might have heard of this artist. This is a painting by uh, a very young Pablo Picasso. Um, you might not know uh, that Pablo Picasso uh, could really paint well, like he could paint better than anyone um, uh, of his time period. Um, but he did that early. So he picked early as like a realist painter and then he moves on to abstraction, right? So here's one of his later abstract works. Um, and we may say like, what just happened there? But um, Picasso was really, really interested in problem solving and the ideas behind art and what is art. And we'll get into that in another class. But my point here is that he went from, he went from realistic to abstract. Here's an artist, uh, Piet Mondrian, and you might have uh, heard of him, and I, I think you've probably been familiar with his paintings, but this is his early work, obviously a very representational still life. It's a gorgeous still life. And he ends up here, <laughs> right? Three primary colors and shapes, and they were breaking apart art. Art had been very kind of uh, maybe uh, for lack of a better word, a little stuffy until uh, these artists came along and started breaking it apart and anything went and they were interested in other problems that artists had not been tackling before, like uh, composition and texture and uh, what what is art, right? They were asking those questions. So Diebenkorn, on the other hand, this is his early stuff. He goes the other way, right? He goes from abstract art to real. So that's actually really interesting. So when a lot of artists, they start, and I believe this myself, I believe you can't really go abstract until you first learn how to um, paint things in a representational way. Um, he does the opposite. He goes from abstract, which is on the right, to uh, something more real, which is on the left, right? That's a, a kind of an aerial view of California. Um, still has abstract qualities, don't get me wrong. It's not like that first um, Picasso painting where it's so tight and real but he goes the opposite direction. So that's kind of the point today. I just wanted to emphasize that. That's a part of the why here. So here is um, one of his paintings. Um, and just to, a lot of times we're like, well, why? What does this all mean? What does abstract art mean? Well, 
Uh, let me just throw out like maybe a real simplified version of why Deben Corn painted what he painted. He was connected to, to his place. Okay, so um, anybody want to guess uh, what part of America this um, uh, painting was influenced by? And you could, you could shout it out. I can't see you, so you could just shout it out if you think. Um, and maybe to make it simpler, is it a warm place or a cold place? <laughs> what do y'all think? Warm place. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So Albuquerque, New Mexico. So guess what? He let the place come into his painting. So um, a lot of times it feels like you need a, you know, a doctorate in painting and fine arts to understand abstract painting. Think of it this way. He loved color. And he was influenced by wherever he lived. Where, when, he, when he moved, his paintings would change. So this is an Albuquerque, New Mexico painting. And it, you could almost think of it, look, imagine like you're in a helicopter looking down you know, on the landscape and it starts to make a little bit more sense. He likes to connect his abstract art with, with something real. So for him, it's place. Um, and for some reason, I, I, I think this is a gorgeous painting, even though I don't quite understand maybe what's going on, the shapes and colors, um, they do something for me and I, 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 it can be as simple as I like those colors, right? That works for me. Okay, here's some more of the Albuquerque uh, paintings. So yeah, lots of deep reds and oranges and yellows in his work, um, but he's, he loves color. This guy is all about color and just kind of brush through here. But these are the Albuquerque paintings. This one's, I, I think this is gorgeous too. It looks to me, if you think of them as an aerial view overhead, looking down on the earth, they start to make a little bit more sense. I think sometimes we have to give ourselves permission um, to like abstract art because sometimes it's just hard to enter. Um, it's hard to understand maybe what's happening, but the colors for me, and these are huge paintings too. Um, forgive me for not showing you know, the scale um, earlier, but these are huge paintings that you just kind of fall into. It feels like you're, you're part of the place I imagine if you see a gallery show of all these paintings together, um, it feels like you're visiting Albuquerque. Okay, so from there, um, he starts to, like I said, most artists go from uh, real to abstract. He starts to tighten up, okay? So we're getting from loose, he starts to tighten up a little bit here. Um, so his paintings start to become a bit more representational. And then remember I said, thinking about an aerial view. He says as much, that's how you can view his early paintings, but he starts to tighten up and now all of a sudden um, we're in California, right? He moves back to California where he's working and teaching and you know, it's a, it's a road, right? We can see the geometric shapes um, as like a landscape, right? And it's, it's um, kind of the view you'd have from an airplane looking down. He's still interested in, in paint. He's a type of artist um, that shows you his paint. You can see here, there's thick paint, right? Um, there are kind of some artists that hide the paint where you're not really even sure. Hey, how did they make that? Because it's so maybe uh, thin and detailed. And then there's artists that put it on like cake frosting. So he's more of the latter, right? Um, but you can see here, if we were to cut this in half, you know, it would become abstraction. But as a whole, all of a sudden, hey, I can see a tree. You know, I can see perspective. I can see sky. You know, you hang this painting upside down, it becomes complete abstraction. So he's kind of right on the line there. That to me is interesting because um, I like artists that are kind of in between um, one thing and the other. He's hard to define. Sometimes the artists that are hard to define, um, they kind of fall through the cracks sometimes because they're hard to, hard to put into a box because a lot of people think art is kind of linear going from, you know, very realistic paintings to pure abstraction. He's doing something in between. He's going back and forth. Here's another two. I love this painting just for the, um, the texture here. Um, it looks like he's rushing, but um, there are lots of layers. Um, and one of his ideas behind painting is not erasing. So he keeps adding, 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 adding. And I think that's why you get that rushed quality, but he's, uh, he's problem solving and he's kind of destroying parts that were before to add more and more and more. So he's adding layers on layers, sometimes thin. He often uses charcoal in his work too, which I find interesting. I'm going to be doing that a little bit today. Okay, and you could just see how tight this painting is. You know, you could see, talking about charcoal, you could see some of his charcoal lines in the lower left kind of mixing in with that paint. But this is getting very tight, right? This is, becomes... Um, uh, a very real place, 
right, with a very kind of defined perspective. Um, and we're actually, you know, able to count uh, palm, palm leaves and we're able to see, you know, what side the window is on the, some of the houses. Um, so it becomes a, a bit tighter. And this is one of his masterworks too. This is um, a huge painting and you could just see the abstract qualities more on the right, but then all together, all those elements together become, become this, in my opinion, gorgeous landscape. I love just looking at that, the red in the upper right-hand corner, the light that's coming through um, the sky there. Um, you know, all of a sudden I'm looking at an abstract shape and, and seeing light. Um, so that's what he's doing. Um, he has allowed me to appreciate other abstract artists because um, I think I can think now of abstract art uh, under these terms that underneath those shapes and colors, there is something sometimes if you search for it. Okay, I'm bringing you to this work. This is not one of his works. This is by an artist, uh, Henri Matisse. You've probably heard of Matisse. Um, he's famous for his dancers and his cutouts, the French painter. Um, who is known uh, for his colors as well. He was a colorist painter, um, very interested in shape and color. So um, Diebenkorn sees this painting, um, which I think it's called View of Notre Dame, um, and uh, it just blows him away. It becomes a very influential work. It's almost like this gives him permission to keep doing what he's doing. He finds Matisse and, and they are very simpatico. Um, and this one as well. Believe it or not, this is Matisse and not Diebenkorn. So um, I often think if artists were to stay alive long enough, they'd, they'd continually grow and change, you know? So Matisse was creating very avant-garde, forward-thinking art, um, you know, and, until the day he died. So this work here, you know, I don't connect with Matisse because I think of uh, Matisse as way more representational, but it's interesting. He was doing um, the same thing you know, before Diebenkorn was born. So Diebenkorn is influenced by that. And then he goes back, he, like he goes back to abstract. But now, now we know that, hey, he's interested in landscape and places. Um, so it helps, it helps the viewer, it helps us understand it a little more. So this is the part of what's called the Ocean Park series. So guess what, he's in California. So is there a more California painting um, than this painting here? Look at those colors. Um, anyone who's looked out into the, the Pacific Ocean probably has seen some of these colors. Look at all the, the blues and it, the, it's so lightweight. And even the way he uses his brush um, to kind of softly layer some of those colors. Um, if you look to the right, it's like the, the four square down, rectangle down, the, the one that has blue on top of pink. Everyone knows uh, um, that's been in some of my demos. I like to use pink first center paintings and put blues on top because they just buzz uh, when they're on top of each other. But just look at that layering of color. Um, I love Diebenkorn because he's, uh, he's kind of my gateway into abstract art because, you know, like a lot of people growing up, I just didn't, I didn't have the tools to understand it, or at least I felt I didn't have the tools to understand it. But uh, Diebenkorn helps you realize there's really nothing to get. Do you like the colors? Do you like the shapes? Do you like looking at the ocean, you know, if you do, you might like his work too. Okay, um, just to show you more of these uh, ocean park paintings, these really make him um, a famous artist too, but you can see um, now he's just dealing with rectangles, um, but I think it's because his work before um, in the landscape area, it makes this so much more interesting to me. And then there's some more and just look at those colors. So many artists are obsessive, you know, oftentimes um, they shift gears, they change, and then they do something and they exhaust the idea. So he's really, um, you know, experimenting with these shapes and colors, just to show you the difference here, how geometric this is, looks like, you know, maybe a ruler was involved. And then this one is far more, more organic. And this feels like it's moving more again towards landscape or maybe even inside a house, maybe it's a, a table with a cloth on it. It feels like it's become more of an interior, um, which uh, Matisse was very interested in. So on the left is Diebenkorn and on the right is Matisse. So what's interesting about Matisse is uh, Matisse is interested um, in not making something look real, but he's interested in space, shape, and color. 
right? Um, he's breaking things down into more basic, almost like almost childlike um, um, uh, dimensions. It's kind of uh, it, it, almost like it's an illustration for a children's book, right? He's trying to look for the elemento, um, but look at that red, red tablecloth and red wallpaper, and one just feeds into the other. Um, you can see that Diebenkorn is using that as well. And then Diebenkorn starts to do figure work, which is on the right and Matisse is on the left. Um, I like to show this because artists don't, they often don't create in a vacuum. Um, if you know an artist's uh, source and their influences, you often could kind of figure out the artist. So um, it's kind of like you are who you love. Um, and that's certainly true for my own work, talking personally, you know, uh, the artists that I love, they, they seep into your identity. But oftentimes you pick certain artists to copy because that's things that you're interested in. You know, like I said, they're simpatico. They were interesting in the same, same ideas, even though they're not alive even at the same time. They're in communication with one another. Um, I can't wait to go back to museums to, to see shows like this. This was a show um, where they combined Matisse's work with Diebenkorn, so you could see them together. And again, Matisse on the left, Diebenkorn on the right. So uh, Matisse often used uh, subjects like people and um, still life. And so that's where Diebenkorn starts to um, find interest as well. There's just a close up here. Just, I wanted to show you the, the textures of the paint um, and the layering. So notice the layering in the lower uh, right-hand corner. Um, look at how that orange is on top of that blue. You have two color opposites, but look what happens. It becomes something kind of interesting. Okay, and I just wanted to show you this work too. Um, he moves back and forth from real to abstract, but look at the difference. Okay, I'll go back again. I'm gonna show you this one where it's like, oh, that's an abstract painting. Don't know what it is. What is it? You know, that's my first question. What is it, you know, but free yourself of that question. What is it? And look at this one and you can see it's almost like, oh, they are approached almost the identical way, but because this has a chair in it, it's somehow easier for us to understand and appreciate. But honestly, the difference between this painting and this one is not very much. So just keep that in mind the next time you look at abstract art, um, it's very connected. It's just kind of blocks of shape and color. Um, and you ask yourself, like, is you could still ask yourself, is it a pretty picture? Um, when looking at abstract art, because my answer for this one would be absolutely. Okay, and then to talk about Matisse a little bit more, big influence, and then it um, pushes him towards um, still life too. So instead of looking, you know, from the, uh, the helicopter or the bird's eye view looking down on the world, all of a sudden he's getting very intimate, right? It's like, this is three inches in front of my face. You know, this is on my table every day. This is, um, um, you know, in my home. So these paintings, instead of going from the outside, you know, um, he's looking on the inside, right? He's, he's going from a uh, big picture to small picture and kind of painting a small world. And I think that's why artists uh, paint still life often because it's usually things that you see every day and um, the artist can make them interesting. But again, is the approach that much different from the landscape? To the abstract, it's all the same. He's solving the same problems, but just using um, different subject matter. Um, and that's often what artists do. Um, you can paint 10 different subjects um, and you might be still doing the same thing with the same approach. And I love, I love this still life. I love the orange peel, which if that's even an orange peel on the lower left, I love it just dripping off the canvas here. And it looks like a you know a bottle of Coca Cola, which isn't so interesting to paint normally, but uh, somehow works. I want to point you to the upper right hand um, of the canvas too, just to talking about um, Diebenkorn adding layers. You can see his brain working there, putting a color down and maybe not liking it, kind of mixing it in. Um, so uh, he doesn't erase. That's one of his. Um, ideas is that um, he doesn't erase, he's more of someone who, who adds instead of takes away. There's some more, and I, I'll give you one guess, you know, where this painting was painted, <laughs> not Albuquerque. 
in here too, just to talk about how detailed he's starting to get. You know, he goes from complete abstract to being able to read, you know, the postage stamp. <laughs> and here's another still life. And then I'm gonna leave you on this one. This is the one I'm gonna be painting today. Um, for one, it's approachable. I find his work kind of complicated. Um, so for me to copy something in a, a short amount of time, I want to be able to feel like I can um, uh, get the, at least the canvas covered. And um, uh, the other works are a bit more massive. This is a little more intimate, it's small, and we definitely can see what it is. But, but with that said, there's a couple of things that we're looking at. You know, we're looking at the way he layers paint. We're looking at the way he chooses colors and we're looking at the way um, he creates space, right? The way he creates these geometric shapes that are all combined in that glass. You know, if we zoom in, it's, it's complete abstraction, right? Um, but the way he organizes those shapes, it somehow becomes a transparent glass where we can tell what color the liquid is. We can tell which way the light is coming from the right, right? You can see that shine on that glass. Um, you can even see the refraction of the knife in, in, in the water or the iced tea or whatever that is. So um, this is the one I'll be looking at uh, today. So um, I'd like to copy that. And um, with that said, uh, before I transition, I'm going to jump off and stop sharing this screen so that I can move to my, my phone to connect. Um, does anybody have any, any feedback or questions or comments? about Richard Devencourt? Where would we see Devenheim here? Do you know? Um, that's a great question. Let me look, let me look into it. Um, I think there's, there's some in the American Art Museum um, okay. downtown and that's connected to the portrait gallery. Okay. Um, and then I think there's a couple in the East Wing too, which I know is closing. It's the last week and it'll be open. It's closing for renovations, I think till June or July. Um, the East Wing it was just yeah the yeah I just read that in the post today. Oh my god! Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, he's yeah he's around for sure. Okay. Good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any any questions or feedback? Okay. Well, I like to keep this uh, an open conversation, especially as I'm painting. So I will switch over. Uh, I'll quickly send a, an email out. Um, to Lika, and then maybe we can um, get this image out there to you guys. Okay, so here's the image um, on my iPad, and then here's my canvas. To be really truthful to Devencorn, you know, I would be going huge, but the point today is just to show you a little bit just about his, maybe the technical aspects um, of his art. Um, and I do wanna read you a quote, which I had um, that I wanna share. But uh, he says, mistakes uh, can't be erased, but they move you from the present position. Uh, and I love that quote because it doesn't just apply to art, but just about most things, but the mistakes move you forward. So as um, a struggling artist, as we all are, um, I like to think that these mistakes that we, we make and we sometimes hold, you know, we hold over our own paintings. Think of it as something that moves you towards something else um, and a solution. So that type of attitude that he has is, is going to help you as an artist um, in great ways. Cause I really do believe that, um, that the paintings um, that you make, you know, they're going to be filled with mistakes, but think of those mistakes as a way to move forward. So I have, my iPad, I have my canvas. I covered it in pink just because I had that color um, already on there. I'm gonna show you um, how to layer uh, the paint in a way to hopefully get in a, a style of demon corn. So he uses uh, oil paints, but um, the way he, he applies paint and layers, it's not all in one sitting. So things are allowed to dry. So acrylic actually works better time-wise because I'm gonna be able to um, cover things pretty quickly and show you the layers of paint. Um, to do that in oils, you know, we'd have to do this in two or three sessions because I'd have to let things dry in between. So I'm going to be using acrylic paint today. Um, I have my acrylic paints out on my uh, nifty foil palette here, but I have some whites. I try to keep it simple um, and mostly primary colors. So 
with a few exceptions. I have uh, my whites and one white. This is my kind of liquidy, thicker or, or thinner, um, cheaper white, which I use this acrylic paint here. And then I have a heavier body, thick acrylic paint. So um, sometimes there's heavy body uh, acrylic. You can see it's standing up more upright and this one's becoming more of a puddle and that's because it's thinner. Then I have my, my yellow, my red and my blue, right? Those are my primary colors. And then a couple earthy tones, which I probably could mix up, but today um, I'm having them out. I have my yellow ochre, burnt umber, and then I have some purple. Now purple is always a tricky color, both I think in oils and acrylic, but look at the, the liquid that's kind of leaching out of it here. Um, that's something that's kind of common with purple paint. So I haven't used purple paint so much um, in acrylic, but I found some and I saw some in the painting. So I'm gonna be using that. All right. Oh, and just to go back, I have my water right here, my paper towel and then my three brushes. I know to be um, honest and to paint like Deben Corn, I want to use um, big, bold brush strokes. Um, so that's something that's important to me. So typically the smaller the brush you have, the more control you have. So tiny brushes give you lots of control because you're gonna be making tiny little brush strokes to kind of create an image. Um, whereas big brush strokes, they free you up. Um, so if you want to paint looser and you want to paint a bit more abstract, you know, a big old brush is going to be your answer. Um, so I'm going to try to use that big brush when possible, at least in the beginning layers. And then I'm going to show you this. I have some charcoal here in my charcoal box that's been with me for more than half my life, right? Um, it just has different pieces of charcoal. Charcoal is a good drawing surface. Um, but it will mix in with the paint. So when you mix um, charcoal and paint, you, you pick up some of the, the, um, the kind of the dust in there. So just keep that in mind. But he likes to show that in his painting. So I, I don't know if I can see too many charcoal marks on this painting in particular, but there was definitely some that I've shown you um, that, that had charcoal in, in the painting. So that's what I'm gonna be using just to try to copy his style. Okay, so drawing is important. Um, in this painting, because there is some symmetry, meaning that, you know, the, the shape of this has to follow some kind of geometric order to look like a glass. I can't just kind of draw, draw it wrong and get the proportions off. So um, one thing I want to see is I want to be able to give myself enough room. So I like to find kind of the halfway point of the picture, which is below the glass. Do you guys see that? So halfway point, just use my hand is about just under that glass. So if I find my halfway point here, right, halfway point is just below the glass. I know that the glass will come, come up a little bit. And here's a fun thing when you're drawing, right? Is find the angle. Is it straight up and down or is it a little bit on an angle? Straight up and down is this. You could see it's a little bit angled. This side, it's actually more straight up and down. So keep that in mind. You can find the angles. It's gonna be especially helpful with that knife. And I'm gonna draw it right to the bottom here. See how I just drew that in? Some, some guidelines. Typically I would do this with paint, but I'm trying to work a little bit more in his style. Okay. Now, another thing I can figure out, halfway points the left side of the glass is just about halfway. Yeah, didn't that work out? <laughs> I should have checked that before. Um, and then how much, is he a glass, glass uh, half full type of artist? Yeah, a little more, a little more than that. <laughs> okay. Uh, and this is just geometric shapes, right? That's all I'm dealing with right now. You know, I can go kind of dark with it. There's some stuff going on there. I don't know if that's ice or what. Reflection, just sketching it in, right? Do I recommend using charcoal to start a painting? Um, again, not, um, not if I don't want the charcoal to mix in with the paint. So 
Um, sometimes I'm asked, is pencil good to start a uh, painting? And uh, sure, I've used pencil, but pencil is not as close to paint as charcoal. Charcoal is clumsy and it's, it's bulkier and it creates uh, more sketchy lines where pencil is pretty exact. So pencil line is often either right or wrong where a charcoal line is a little bit more honest because it's looser, like paint. Remember, paint is clumsy. It's a clumsy kind of tool that we use. And that's the magic. Find the angle. Here we go. See that? This isn't you know, too technical. It's just finding the angle. It helps me so much. Now, there's all kinds of stuff with that shape of that knife that's going to keep me from drawing it straight. So what I'm doing is I'm just ignoring it all just to get a straight line in, right? I'm not showing the handle at this point and even the curve and I'm kind of off, but that's okay. I'm just trying to get that angle going all the way down. And remember I said it's refracted. That's when the water um, changes the position of the object. It's off. It's nice. It's nice that it's off. I don't have to be perfect. This is actually a little more curved. I'm making really dark lines. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the paint. My handle goes right off the page here. Okay, there's my drawing. Now there's other stuff going on in here, but honestly, it's, it's kind of, it's all detail. You can see charcoal smudges, right? I did that on purpose just to show you, like it's, it's gonna be messy, whatever. We're gonna cover it in paint anyways. We'll see what we get. Might be frustrated, might not. <laughs> okay, so how do I approach this? Well, one thing I'm seeing here is all the blue that's coming through. See all the blue coming through the yellow? That's why I used acrylic today because I wanna get some of that blue down first. So that's where I'm gonna start is I'm gonna coat uh, that background with some blue paint. So I'm gonna use my ultramarine blue and white. Why? Well, it's the blue I have out and actually maybe a touch of green. Maybe a little bit of water. Now, I should tell you, because of my lighting, um, I have kind of an orange light shining down in here. If I was painting this outside, you'd, you'd see probably a better, brighter blue that I see, but just keep that in mind. We are limited by the technology, meaning the camera and the way it picks up light. So look at, oh, look at the charcoal mixing in. <laughs> so charcoal actually changed the color. So what does that mean? It makes me think that charcoal was part of Deben Corn's palette, right? Meaning that it affected his colors, that he had maybe a little bit of gray or black mixed in with a lot of his colors. And maybe that kept some colors from being, you know, maybe as bright as one might think. That's just food for thought. Interesting. Okay, getting that blue down. I'm using a pretty big brush too. And I'm trying to be thick with the paint. Meaning I want it opaque. I want it to cover up that pink because really what I see is a lot of blue underneath. Okay, so already, already I kind of see just in my brush work, um, a roughness and a looseness that frankly, I'm not used to in my own personal paintings because I tend to be a little tighter. So if you wanna loosen up, copy a loose painter. One thing I'm noticing is, I guess I see some blue underneath here. So add it in. Because we're gonna be going over that with kind of a, a yellow white in the end. Now, do I cover all this with blue? I don't want to lose my shape. So I did this area because it's really transparent. It's, you can see the background. Okay, I think I might let that dry a little bit because I'm going to be going in with yellow 
in a moment. With oil, I'd have to let it dry at least a day, probably more. Um, with acrylic, it's a matter of minutes, which is a benefit um, today. Okay, now let me get some of those blues in, right? Uh, actually, let me back up. I typically, I typically like to paint in some kind of order. Um, this was kind of prepping my canvas, just getting those blues down. Um, but I typically like to go from dark to light, especially with oil and acrylic. Why? Well, it's just basically an, an order or a structure that I'm following. Um, even with abstract art, it's good to follow structure and to be structured. Otherwise, um, you can get lost. So if I tell myself I'm going to start with dark, work my way up to light, which might be that uh, white background, uh, or these highlights here, I think we're going to have uh, an easier time than if I just did it kind of randomly. So with that said, I'm going to get some of these darks in, which are near black. So I'm going to use burnt umber and ultramarine blue, which make a very nice black. Looks like there's more brown up here than blue. So I can do that. Remember, our Deepen Corns is really about color. You're showing color. So if you're afraid of color, I hear that often from students, I'm afraid to use color. Copying an abstract painter forces you to just go for it. Now I see lots of blues here with the knife. And I'm, I'm painting thick too. Trying to get in some blues. I added a little bit of white to my blue here, moving away from black and moving towards dark blue. I should say I've never copied this artist before. Um, part of this class is sharing, you know, the painters that I look at, you know, the books I have open when I paint. Um, so I've always admired his work. But I can't say I totally understood what he was doing until until today when I was um, you know going over the the slideshow. It really helped kind of put into words what I did like about him. Sometimes you like somebody, and you're not sure why. That's never been so true then with abstract uh, art. Okay, getting some of that blue in here. Now look, it's my, all my colors look very gray because of that charcoal and because of the lighting. I actually wonder, there, yeah, thicker paint. But am I as concerned about the drawing as as I would if I were copying someone like um, Whistler or John Singer, Sergeant of Vermeer. Like, no, I'm not. I don't think that's what this painting is totally about. I'm kind of sacrificing some of my drawing here because it's a little um, imperfect, let's say, to get the feel of the paint and the texture just to go that thick. Okay, I got carried away and got, went right into that knife when I was supposed to be going dark to light. <laughs> so I'm gonna go back to the glass here and make some here, some lines. I think it will be easier. Now, one thing I'm trying to keep in my head, there are a few times that I started to try to wipe off, even though it's acrylic, but the point is when you make mistakes to leave it and move forward. So there are already a couple of things I might change. The blue that I'm using, it's just too, it's too dark. That ultramarine blue, I think I need a brighter blue. So I think I'm gonna move on, um, let this dry and then get, a different blue. I think I might try a cobalt or cerulean blue um, just to make an adjustment. You never know what colors you need. So let me grab that really quick. And let's see if a blue makes a difference. 
So here's um, a cerulean blue, which is, they call it a warmer blue. So thinking it's a little more green. And let's see, it might be a little wet. Ah, that's much better. So let me add a little white to it so you can see it better. Let me move the iPad. Sometimes you can see the color correction. You can see it better, but when the, the iPad's bright, so it makes everything darker. There we go. That's the blue. Much better. The great thing about acrylic, it dries pretty quick. Starting to get in some of that color here. What's nice about seeing a, someone paint it in person is <laughs> not to say I'm making a, 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 a poor um, copy, but I can see how hard this is because of how, how challenging it is to get my paint to look like his paint. Right, so I'm sure there are gonna be things I like about this in the end, but right now, you know, that struggle, that's how you understand the artist, getting some of those lights in. I know that might change, that might change later. Okay, I can say my gloss um, just grew a little bit, but that's okay. We're gonna be adding more layers anyways. Now in here, this is where I really think, you know, this looks like an Albuquerque painting here, just that shape and color. So I'm gonna be getting in some of that. I have, I'm used a little red and yellow ochre. Scrub that in, maybe some white too. That's a nice color. I had some line drawn in there. I kind of erased it. Now this may not be your taste um, to be this loose, but, uh, and I'll be honest, it's not mine either, but I think, you know, I had a teacher tell me once, every artist wants to be loose. And so this is maybe a shortcut to get there is by copying somebody somebody's painting that you like. There, now that's the best part of the painting for me that I've done, because it's unfussy and it's thick. Okay, let me get that orange handle up here. Orange, of course, my red and yellow, and maybe a little yellow ochre and then the charcoal mixes in, which honestly, I see some streaks in there. I don't doubt that that's what's happening. And I wanna go thick paint. Every artist, you know, wants to be loose and bold and thick. This is how it goes. When you, when you first start painting, you tend to use thicker paint because maybe you don't know any better. Um, and then you tend to tighten up a bit and not use enough paint. <laughs> And then as you grow, um, you use, um, as you grow, you, uh, you end up using more because you become more confident. Okay, I'm going to fill in, I think that background. Let me go to that bigger brush. And here's where I, I was talking about cake frosting. So here's where I get to frost the cake. But notice there's some transparency, right? It's not evenly uniform purposefully showing you that color underneath. So I'm gonna mix up some white and maybe use some leftover color from that brush handle, which was red, yellow, and yellow ochre. Maybe a little more white. Yeah, that's it. Now, I don't wanna say I have one shot at this, but 
I want to cover it and leave it. So I'm at one time going thick with paint, but I'm also trying to allow some of that color to come underneath it. What's nice about going with the background on top is I get to kind of clean things up a little bit, change my shapes that weren't working for me before. So here, I'm gonna show a few strokes that are transparent. And why am I going in all different directions? Well, you can see here, brush strokes are coming every which way. This is called cross hatching when you go back and forth over on top. Kind of want to do this in one stroke. Okay. Keep dipping in paint. That's important. That's fun. Now, an artist gets to set their own kind of standards. So if you say, hey, this is a loose painting, you get to be as loose as you want. I think I teach a lot from um, a point of a teacher who wants to give students permission to try these things and find ways to try these things. All right, look at, look at this, this triangle here, right? And look at mine. I barely gave any space. So I need a, well, I thought I needed to switch to a smaller brush, but let me, let me see if the big brush can do it. Jim, what colors did you mix together again to get that yellow? Yeah, I used, it's a little yellow ochre, yellow and red. So I'll show you here. It's these three together. Oh, okay. And it's a touch, it's a little bit on the brush. I think I dipped in what was over here because they're all mixed together and then brought it here in mostly white. So a yellow ochre and a yellow. Yeah, yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, sometimes the big brush, you know, it allowed me to get that shape back. Now my knife shrunk a little bit, but I can adjust that later. So Jim, what I'm seeing is a, a sort of a deep melon color, whereas the one on the left is white. Are you planning to go over it in white? Which uh, color? So what you're applying right now appears on my screen as a deep melon color, whereas the one on the left is white. This here? That appears white. And, yeah. and what you're putting on is a, is a deep melon um, oh, yeah. color. So I'm just wondering much if it's... close. Yeah, it's much closer in person. Let's see if that changes it. Oh, completely, completely yeah. changes. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Yeah, when you know, it is next to it. The way the light affects it, um, yep. it is it is very yellow orange, almost a yeah. lighter shade of the the knife handle. Completely, completely changes it. That is very interesting. Okay, would it thank be more? You. Would it be more helpful not to see? The, the image? Oh, no, I love seeing the image. Okay, yeah, yeah, so keep that in mind. But, yeah, oh, that's, that's... yeah, okay, but I think I think we would really need to see it without that reflection of the iPad there to yeah. see all the color. So maybe periodically just pull it, because also right now, the blue is not looking blue, it's looking just green. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Uh -huh. everything's been before mixed in. Lemon, okay, or very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that out. That's a good reminder to, uh, like you said, periodically move the, move the, the iPad. All right, now, now that I have that mostly covered, I'm gonna go in a little more yellow here. I'm gonna go in and this is where you're more likely to overdo it. So just look, you know, look and see like, oh, there's a little texture here and there. Maybe do I want to go a little thicker with the paint? Maybe a couple thicker brush strokes. But remember, you don't want to totally cover that background. But I'm going thicker with the paint. 
See, it just adds a little more interest. You know, and anybody copying this, today you are an abstract painter. How cool is that? <laughs> and guys, now this little box down here, it looks like an ice cube or something. It's great. Look at how the, the flat, it's a flat brush. So there's different types of brush. Segway, flat brush. This is called the filbert, right? It's rounded on top, but flat on the side, but rounded on top. This is a flat brush, flat on top, flat on the side. But look at if the brush fits the subject, like it's a perfect kind of rectangle shape. One brush stroke makes that shape. Instead of tiny brushes trying to paint that thing in. Okay. So I think I'm close to, yeah, I think I'm close to more adjustments and smaller brushes. So let's see. We're good. Let me move to this brush. Let me move to this brush here. Okay, let's see up there. A little smaller, but I wanna be able to get in some of that color and white and purple. Maybe I'll start with the, actually, I'm gonna start with the knife. I'm gonna make that knife bigger on the right. I know we're reading that it's just dark, but I swear it's blue. Let's move, zoom in here. Let's see, does that help? You can see the blue. There we go. Okay. All right, so blue. And I'm going pure paint. I'm going thick with the paint. I know I'm losing some stuff that I had underneath, but it's all layers, right? That's the kind of the operative word here is uh, it's added, you're adding, not subtracting. There's some dark blue, which it all looks like, I understand it looks kind of the same with the iPad, but it is darker. That's a mistake, right? We make those, don't we? Go over it. Good to have a couple brushes on hand. One for one color, one for maybe the background. There we go. Look at that, we're cleaning it up, believe it or not. And it gets lighter down here. And then it gets really light. So I'm going to be good. Really bold here. Let's zoom in. Let's do a gloss. I have a chunk of white paint here. There, look at that. Thicker paint. Now I like to mix in a little warmth into my whites and my highlights. So I've grabbed some of that yellow that I use for the background. I really want to be thick here. It's kind of like thick yet intentional. Can you see the texture? It actually has a shadow. Hmm, fun. Okay, now I have all kinds of color mixed in my brush here, including blue. That's okay. carve out that shape. So now you can adjust. There's something liberating knowing that I'm not erasing. You just keep, keep adding. Um, and it feels very true to the, the painting. Oh, that highlights nice. That makes a difference. Same thing here. Gives you that water effect. All right, and then I'm gonna get some more orange on that handle. A little truer orange. Oh, too much. 
then I really want to show texture. Look at that. Down here too, it's, it could be a little lighter. Something I should add is like, I, I can't take away the type of painter I am too. So even though I'm painting like demon corn, or at least attempting to, I'm making a, a, a gym original in a sense too, because I, I can't get away from my tendencies, my practices, my preferences, all those things. So keep that in mind. I had a teacher that would say, you know, the further away from home you are, the closer you get. So <laughs> you kind of know what kind of artist you are when you copy somebody because you, you probably take on that artist um, the only way that you can, if that makes sense. And I love looking at copies of famous artworks by famous artists because they can't help but throw themselves in there. It's like a cover song. Getting some of that dark in. Okay, get some blue. This is looks like some blue in there and that weird shadow. Maybe for me, the most interesting part of the painting is, is what's going on down, what's going on down here, where it really does become abstract. At one at this point in the painting, too, it's I'm really kind of hit. Hit kind of a groove. There's a miracle, you know, just by getting it all, all covered with paint. And that's hard to do. Just adding some dark blue there. Ah, see, I tried to erase. There's no erasing, only adding. There we go. Paint over it, <laughs> and it shows. That makes a difference. I. I think doing this in oil would be tricky because there's a lot of maybe waiting and patience. It makes me think he's a, a patient artist because he's putting stuff down and waiting a day for it to dry or two. There, I got that dark in. Jim, did he use both oils and acrylics? Uh, mostly oils that I know of. I think I've seen charcoals and, and watercolors too, but primarily oils. Yeah, that's interesting because with that background, in order to get the uh, base colors to show through, he really would have to wait with each color, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that makes me think, you know, a lot of times these artists had um, more than one painting at a time going, you know, so that you can constantly keep working. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. There's, there's some patience there. So this is great. This is the first um, session that I am attending. And one of my neighbors had recommended your sessions. And, and this is oh, yeah. really wonderful. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking a watercolor class now. Um, I don't actually own any acrylics, but I've got some water-based oils. Anyway, I have a question about the background. How did yeah. you choose to do your base layer? Because in the finished painting, we can see clearly white and blue and orange you could have started with the blue or the orange. Is there, um, do you tend to go with a warmer color first or do, um, could it have been either one? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think, I, when I look at the detail here, I could tell that it's thick kind of white, warm paint on top of blue. So in this case, I could tell that there was blue underneath. If I started with the light and scrub blue on, I think it would be, it'd be maybe challenging to get this effect, but, with that said, if you're with your own work, yeah, you could certainly do any color. The pink you saw, that's my preference. I tend to just cover a lot of paintings with that pink because um, it tends to be a color. A lot, a lot of times I'm painting landscapes, so I'm doing lots of blues, right? Blues in water, blues in skies. And a lot of times blue on top of pink just looks very nice because they're kind of uh, opposites in a sense. So um, I did a demo yesterday, though, with the class doing landscapes, looking at um, the artist Gustav Klimt, and he has lots of greens in his, his landscape, so I, we ended up covering it with green first. So it's kind of like look for a predominant color in the painting, you know, so blue, yeah, blue or yellow would be good, but the, the yellow white is so close to the canvas color that you start with that the blue is a nice contrast because then you can go over it be messy and you don't have to worry about that, you know, the ugly white of the canvas showing through, if that helps. 
Yeah, it does. I think um, looking at your canvas originally, that background that you now set as pink looked to me more orange. Um, uh, so yeah, was... right now, are we seeing some of that original pink? Is it, is it showing through or have you really covered most of it? Up? I really have covered it. You see it here, um, just to point to you right here against the knife. Um, and to me, that pink is much more pleasing than seeing like the white of the canvas come through. So I'm seeing it a little bit here and here, you know, around the knife. Look at how, how nice the pinks look around the blue. Right. But okay. As far as the background goes, I tried pretty hard to get it completely covered. So I'm only really seeing it around the still life. So the purpose of putting it down is so that when you have some areas left that you're not seeing the white, or sometimes you put it down with the intention that you're going to see much more of it. Yeah, exactly. The answer is both. So for one, it, it the hardest, I think the hardest like solution, or sorry, the hardest problem to solve in, in, in painting is often just getting rid of all the white of the canvas. So I, for me, it's like a shortcut just to get started because when you have a color down, it, to me seems mentally easier than just having a intimidating white canvas. So if I make mistakes and don't cover the whole thing with it, it's pleasing to see some of that color come through. Oftentimes like pastel artists will use like color paper for that reason too, just to get rid of that ugly white. But um, you know, there's a whole style. I did a, um, one of these classes on Whistler where he shows uh, that pink coming through all his blues so that if you're using really like less thick paint, and you're using thin transparent layers, you can show some of that pink coming through. Here, I'll, sh I'll show you one. I have it within arm's reach. Here's a landscape I'm working on. Um, there's like extreme close up, but you could see the pink coming through in the sky here. So that's something that, that I use to my benefit, right? Letting that pink show through that blue and with really thin layers, you know, you kind of can create a color that you couldn't get by mixing paint. So you can see some of that pink coming through that warmth, right? right. If I were pink, if I was trying to paint pink and green together, I would get mud, but by doing the pink, you could see it here by doing the pink first, it allows me to kind of create new colors, if that helps. Yeah, it does. And what you just held up and showed us, that is painting on a piece of wood, right? This is um, this is linen wrapped, yeah, wrapped on a stretch canvas. Oh, oh, okay, okay, I see. Yeah. I thought it, I thought it was a wood. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't painted on a circle, it's it's interesting. <laughs> it's fun, but challenging. <laughs> okay, and just to wrap up, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, one thing I noticed there's a, a beautiful purple coming through here. I'm going to add purple and red. See how good my purple does. And you can see that there, nice color. You know, save your small brush work for the end. I tried not to use the small brush too early. Now where I said purple, it's kind of slimy. It always is. So I had to mix a little bit of white in with it. Purple's a very often transparent color. All right. One thing that's happening is colors as they dry uh, tend to sink in. So like this was very bright before and now it's, it's gotten kind of dark. So I'm gonna add a little color there, a little more blue. Remember demon corn likes color. So if you find your colors get muddy, the great thing about layering is you can just go back and add more color. There we go. Okay, anything else? Now I can be kind of judicious and really look to see, does it need anything else? Made that too dark. Oh, excuse me, too light. Let me go and make some dark here. There you go. It's a push and pull. Often you add something, it's maybe not right or wrong. It's there, but that will lead you to a more correct brush stroke. Okay. Anything else down here? It's a little muddy, so 
Remember, he likes colors. I see ochre and blue, so I see green. There's the green here. Not bad. All right. When you don't know where else to go, that's a sign. You're either stuck or done, but because of time, let's see. I think I wanna open it up for some questions. So I'll leave the painting at that. And um, this, took more, this took more time than I, I imagined. It was harder than I thought, um, which is often the case with abstract. I think it's harder to copy abstract artists and impressionists because the brushstrokes um, are seemingly random and chaotic, but they make this, this picture. Whereas, you know, painting something very tight, you almost see more of the process. So this is a, um, a good exercise. If anybody's painting along with me, I would love to see your work if you wanted to share. Any feedback or comments too are welcome. I didn't paint along, but I'm gonna try to paint this later. Oh, uh, good. But I don't see the colors that you're talking about, the way it shows up on my screen. So um, I'm not worried about the color. Um, it was yeah. very, this is very interesting. I really enjoy these sessions because I don't know anything about some of these artists. Oh, great. You know, That's... I go to museums a lot and um, yeah. nice to, to know something about abstract. Usually I'm one of those people who looks at it and says, oh, what is this? <laughs> Well, kind of thing, but we all are, Fran. That's a, we all are like that. Yeah. <laughs> but you still have your favorites. I mean, why does anybody like Rothko? You know, but yeah. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Rothko is my. He was kind of my entry point in abstract art. I felt like I didn't have to get it to get it, if that makes sense, because it just mm. it made me feel right. Calm made me feel something, you know? Yes. I think our yeah. emotional response, our yeah. emotional response is how we should be looking at art, not our intellectual <laughs> response. So oftentimes our brain turns into this unfeeling, rigid, you know, this piece of steel when we see abstract art, because we just go right to the why, instead of like, how does this make me feel? And if it mm. frustrates you, maybe that's Good the job. piece to talk about, yeah, or think about, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let me flip around here. Well, it's a pleasure, pleasure painting with you all this morning. Thank you. Great job. Yeah, I yeah. really enjoyed it. I'm going to try we it later. It. <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah. And the intention of this is to sit back and just watch too. You know, there's no mm -hmm. pressure to paint. But hopefully it does, you know, fire or, or trigger something because, you know, the, the urge to paint is something that, that you, I, I think that's the inspiration, right? It's just, uh, if, if you feel it, you have to do it. You have to get it out because it will, it passes sometimes. And I've, there had so many paintings in my head that haven't come out because I just didn't jump on that, that flash. Hmm. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> thanks thanks you know, for the background too on Diebenkorn. Uh, that was pretty interesting. I didn't, I was not familiar with him at all. And so no. seeing that variety of paintings was really good. Oh, great. Thank <laughs> you. It was. I, I enjoyed it completely, as I usually do, Jim. Thank you. Oh, yes. you're welcome. Thank so you much, Jim. It was great. Good job. Jim, Jim, can you send your um, finished product and I can share with the group? And also anyone else, if you do do the painting, if you can send me an email copy, we like, you know, as I say before, we like to share. Okay. <laughs> It might be a while. That's fine. <laughs> I don't care. It doesn't matter. Thank you, though. Thank you all. Thank you, Shirley. Thank, Thank you, Jim. Jim. Thank all God. a good weekend. Okay. You all have a great weekend. Have a good you one. You too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Bye. Jim. Bye. Bye. See you next time.